So as indeed we are in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and the Holy Spirit presence in this room and with those on Zoom, wherever we are, the Holy Spirit is with us and the Holy Spirit is in us. That's what it tells us in John 14. And as we stand confident in the truth of that, we know that God has got plans and purposes for our lives and is teaching us a far better way to live. We've all been influenced by the ways of the world. Everybody around us in different relationships, this has impact into our lives and the choices of other people, even today, can affect us. But whatever is going on around us, whatever other people are to us and however they are living their lives and the choices that they make, we're not responsible for other people and their choices. We're only responsible for us ourselves and how we choose to live according to the will of God. And God is transforming and changing us constantly and is always teaching us a far better way. And there's sometimes that we go voluntarily, don't we? We see the truth, we hear the truth, we know the truth, and our spirit just soars to the Lord and says, yes, Lord, and help me to be that person that you call me to be. Help me to live that way in you. And there is great excitement. There are other times when the word of the Lord comes and the spirit is moving, and there's something in us that just stubbornly says, why should I? I don't want to. And it's that resistance of the humanity of the flesh that refuses to give up the control that through pride we think we know better than God. And we can frequently be walking in the flesh. We confess the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over our lives. We believe that we're living in him. But there are still moments because of the humanity of who we are where we resist. We don't see the logic. We don't see the sense. If somebody's caused offence to us, we don't see the sense when God says that we should go and apologise to the other person. Everything in us says, but Lord, they're the ones who are wrong. Why should I go and apologise to them? And what if they don't forgive? And we wrestle with God, don't we? Because we process everything through human logic. We don't necessarily do it through the leading of the Spirit to ask, Lord, I don't understand, but... Because you ask, I will. You know, when the fishermen were told to throw out their nets, Peter, in the boat with Jesus, Jesus has just used Jesus' boat, pushed out onto the waters, and Jesus used it as a platform to be able to speak to the people. Peter willingly took Jesus out into the boat, even though he'd been up all night fishing. But because Jesus said, put out your boat, for me, Peter did. And you can only imagine the authority and the power of Jesus in that boat that would have covered Peter in such grace and power. What was he thinking when he's hearing this man speak what he's speaking? And Jesus finishes his sermon and then he says to Peter, throw your nets out into the water. And Peter's tired, he's been up all night, they've been fishing all night and they've caught nothing. But Jesus asked him to put out the nets. And Peter says, we've been out, out all night and caught nothing. But because you say, I will. In other words, this makes no sense to me why you're asking me to do this at this time of the day. We would normally fish during the night. That is when the fish are caught. And here we are in the morning in the daylight. It's contradictory to a fisherman's ways. But because you ask, I will. And the consequence was an obedience to Jesus putting out the nets. They caught a haul that was so big, he had to call other men to help him pull it to the boat. God doesn't ask us to understand. He just asks that we believe him and by faith we trust and obey. And it's in that that there is a unity of heart, of connection of our heart to the Lord through the Holy Spirit that draws us into a depth of relationship. And then we find ourselves, I mean, that's our own personal choice that we choose to follow Jesus. And then we find ourselves in church. We find ourselves in relationship with other believers. And we are all very unique 
diverse individual characters with a history, a journey of life that we've been living through that we don't understand how each person has suffered or achieved. But suddenly we find ourselves in fellowship as God draws us into fellowship in a particular church. And I praise God for the body of Christ in this, this church. The different people that we are, the different relationships that we have, the different gifts and talents that exist. But how God navigates our life journey that we find our place amongst it all in the way that God wants to balance things out. And it's exciting, and it, but it can be a challenge, can't it? And the very essence of the Christian faith is to love one another. The very essence of the Christian faith is God is love. And he says to love others as he loves us. But as we all know, because of the diversity of the characters that we are, some people are not easy to love. But God doesn't say just love the lovely. He says, love your enemy, love the unlovely. And that's the challenge that we have. And we either take on board the challenge and say, like Peter did to Jesus, well, because you ask, I will put out my nets. Or we say, keep me away from that person. I can't stand them. And in doing so, we keep a separation and a breakdown of relationship. And that isn't what God is asking. So God calls his people to live in unity, one unto the other. And it's important that each and every one of us makes every effort to live together in harmony with each other. It doesn't matter what we believe. It doesn't matter the diversity of our history. It doesn't matter what our lives have been up until this point in time. The reality is when we find ourselves in fellowship one unto the other, whatever our beliefs and our differences, God commands us that we do all to love each other. Life is messy. Relationships can be messy. We've all had breakdowns of relationship. We've all had great unity of relationships at times. But we all know how easily relationships break. And it takes time and determination and effort and faith to work through reconciliation with somebody that we've had that breakdown with. But nothing's impossible for God. He is the God of reconciliation and grace. And it's in times of stress in this life that many relationships become strained and we can end up hurting each other. And often we do it without realizing we're doing it because our focus and our perspective is not on the impact on other people around us. We're self-seeking. We're self-purposed. The only one that sometimes matters in our, in our world is me, myself, and I. And we walk in the trinity of me, myself, and I instead of the trinity of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And all the time that the me, myself, and I dominates in the great pride and self-preservation is because the humanity of who we are does make life all about us. And when we come to faith in Jesus, it's life all about him. And we're learning that different way with him. So God commands us to love in all the messiness of life, in all the times of stress and strain that relationships go through. And it's in the stress and strain that we often end up hurting each other and we start to destroy the very unity that we've been working hard to achieve. Where our hearts have surrendered in a commitment to and then suddenly things get rocky as the selfishness of each individual comes into the relationship and we start pulling away in our own wants. You know, whenever I talk to young couples about marriage, it's helping them to understand that marriage is two imperfect people who have been used to living as the I. Your world revolves around you as the one person and what you like, what you don't like, what you want, what you don't want, your vision, your, your hope for the future. But then they meet each other and they fall in love. And when we first meet each other, there's that attraction maybe to what we physically look like. There's that attraction to how we speak and what we sound like and what we present and how we love, how we encourage, how we show grace towards each other. And in the courtship, there's that romance, isn't there, of making every allowance 
because all we want to do is see the good. We're attracted to this person. We don't want to break relationship with them. And they may do something wrong, but because we're so in love with that person, we will allow those errors to happen. And the love grace covers them. And we navigate the journey to that point of commitment to want to come into marriage. And in all the romance of romantic love, it's all beautiful to look forward to the wedding day and all the lavishness of the celebration. But then at the end of the wedding day, you are committed to living the rest of your life with this person that you have vowed that you will love and live with and surrender all into. And it's all very nicey-nicey in the honeymoon period, isn't it? Of that first commitment out of the celebration. And then you have to settle down into everyday life. And then you start to realize the little niggles, they were always there throughout the courtship. But because you love them, you cover them. And now suddenly you realize, I'm now living with this person in this home, and I can't get away from those niggles. If we continue to show love and grace, the love and grace covers those niggles and we make every allowance and love each other. And we help each other and we reach out to each other and it's the preferring of each other. But it isn't long before things settle down into the, into the true reality, the irritation takes place and suddenly we find ourselves resenting each other. And those niggles get magnified as we focus on them because we, as human beings, will always focus on the negative rather than the positive. And all, everything that we focus on to gets magnified that the positive decreases. We get blinded to it. And we forget why we fell in love with that person. We forget why we wanted to spend the rest of life with that person. Do I really have to spend my life for the rest of my life picking up dirt, dirty laundry from the bathroom floor? Why is it that suddenly he can take everything or she can take everything to the kitchen, but they leave it on the countertop right above the dishwasher? They don't go the next step to open the dishwasher door and to put it in. And to begin with, the love grace covers, oh, it's fine, I will do it, sweetheart. And then as time goes on, it's for goodness sake, why are you not helping by doing that? And then we start, that's where the cracks appear. Marriage is all about loving and preferring each other, being prepared to serve and humbly encourage that person that they have a far, far better life of love and living because you are in it and you bring every blessing and every love grace towards each other. But it only takes one person Marriage is all about the two eyes coming together and being, being we. Marriage is about what are we going to do? How do we feel about this? What do we want to have? What are we believing for? What is our vision together? How do we see this plan of life working out? What is our commitment one to the other to live at this life well, to love, to encourage and to support? that even in the difficult times, we will not change our heart towards each other. So there's a, a, a we that is caused by the coming together, and there is a preferring of each other, and a love grace that covers each other in the imperfections of who we are. But it takes a lot of courage and determination to enable that marriage to flow and to thrive. I was speaking to somebody yesterday who was talking about they're going to be celebrating their golden wedding next year. There's not many people in today's life can say, I have been married that long, that I'm in a place to celebrate. Because the world has become very selfish as the, it goes out of the we back into the I of what I want, and I'm upset with you, and I don't want to spend the rest of my life with you. Thank you very much. And sadly... Marriages get divided and divorce becomes the norm. Whereas in times gone past, people got married in true commitment. And they made that commitment really believing they were going to spend the rest of their life together and have old age together. And they were committed into it. But the moment it becomes fractured and the enemy comes in and one person decides, I don't like this, I don't want this, and you're not 
as good as I thought you were. And I'm going to point out every negativity and frailty and failure that you make. And I'm going to find every reason that I don't have to spend the rest of my life with you. That's the open door the enemy will come through to separate, kill and destroy. God calls us into unity. Satan's goal is to destroy unity. Unity in marriage, unity in parent to child relationship, sibling rivalry, friendships break down. How much more does the enemy want to come to separate, kill and destroy within the church? But we have to stand, we have to stand in that fight and determination that in the battle that belongs to the Lord, that as we stand to fight together, we learn a way to live in peace with each other and to have harmony between ourselves. God is giving us the ability to be patient, to be kind and to be loving through actions and words. And the word of God reminds us of our responsibility as believers on how to lead the way for unity amongst all people. Because if we as Christians don't understand love and grace that has been lavished over our life, that we choose to give it away to other people, how will the world ever learn a different way to the selfishness that the enemy creates, where in the world it's all about me, myself, and I? And there are many scriptures that are written, and we're just going to focus on a few of them today. And we're going to look initially at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 1. Which reads, As a prisoner for the Lord then, Remember, Paul was in prison when he wrote many of the letters to the churches of encouragement that even though he was bound up in chains physically and imprisoned away from the people, he never took his focus off who God is and his servant heart before the Lord to minister to the people and to teach the people. So here he is, he had every reason to say, I'm not writing anymore, God, until you get me out of here. Don't expect me to keep ministering in you, God, whilst I'm suffering. But we know Paul's journey, shipwrecked, beaten, persecuted, put in prison, coming close to death many, many times at the hands of man. But it never deterred him from standing in the truth of who God is. So here he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We all know that we don't deserve what Jesus did on the cross, but by his grace and his love, he died on the cross, even though we are still sinners. He died to cover our past sin, our present sin and our future sin. So he says to us, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. In other words, understand, appreciate, take to heart and value what Jesus has done for you. What are you willing to do for him? That our life lines up with who Jesus is. Our life becomes an echo in the very nature of who Jesus is on how we learn to live relationally one and to the other. Be completely humble and gentle. Humility is the opposite of pride. The pride in the eye, the selfishness of the flesh, will always say, I want, I'm right, you can't tell me what to do. And all the time we are in that pride of self-elevation that we believe we are better than everybody else. And the only voice and opinion that matters is ours then pride will lead us in the ways of the world. Whereas when we are completely humble under Jesus, to understand we do not deserve what he's done for us, but by his grace we are loved and he leads our lives as we choose to surrender and obey him. It's that love and grace that is lavished over us that we are to show one and to the other. We have to be humble. We don't have to believe that we are right all of the time. We can get it wrong. We do make mistakes. 
What are we going to do with those mistakes? Will we take ownership of them, be accountable and repent and learn a better way? Or are we going to live in the enemy's way of just making blame and excuse and denying any responsibility for the choices that we're making? So Paul encourages us to be humble, humble ourselves before our holy God, lay down our pride and examine our heart out always to consider the attitude of our heart and what we are doing to each other relationally. So be humble and gentle. Somebody who is gentle has a consideration of the other person, to listen to the other person and to consider different perspectives. And there is, in that humility, it's a very gentle, caring approach one and to the other. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. In other words, show the same grace and patience to each other as Jesus shows to us. Jesus knows how long it's going to take you and me to surrender to what he is asking of us. And he gives us every love, grace and time to navigate the journey in all the twists and turns of our wrong thinking and our wrong attitude, our wrong actions, stepping out of his will and going astray. And he waits patiently and lovingly to, for us to come back, to recognize our need of him and to repent and come back onto that narrow road with him. He's patient. He bears with us in love and he asks us to be patient with each other. In other words, give each other time to grow and transform and be changed and make wise choices that we come into a right counterbalance one unto the other. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. We, we have to make an effort. It doesn't happen easily. It's a constant choice of the flesh to surrender our hearts, to work towards that unity in the Holy Spirit that God desires that we will live in, in such incredible love one unto the other. But no matter how big we mess up, there is love and encouragement and determination to help each other to overcome. So we have, we have to make every effort. It's not about us. It's not about the me, my, myself and I always having what I want. It's looking out for each other and preferring each other. What is going on in somebody else's life that would cause them to be so reactive in a moment in time and be totally contradictory to how we believe they normally behave? that we can actually not be offended and absorb the hurt from what somebody's doing, but we actually love enough to say, are you okay? You know, it's something when you're working in an office and you have a good working relationship with a colleague, but one day they come in and every time you look at them or speak to them, they're biting your head off and it's totally out of character. Now you can retaliate and be angry. You can go to the boss and complain that you're being bullied. Or you can stop and say, Lord, this isn't how this person normally is. What is happening here? That we lay down the offense and the other person is more important than we are. And we approach them in love and grace and draw side by side with them calmly and just say, are you okay? And it could be that they've got grief going on because they've just lost somebody very close to them. It could be they've just had a row with their spouse and they, they've driven to work knowing that actually they're in the wrong, but they don't want to go home tonight to actually face it. They're struggling in their own personal life with a battle that's going on and they don't know how to contend with it. So they take it out on everybody else around them. You've done nothing wrong, but they bite at you out of their sense of them being, being wrong. So when the word says make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace, it means that when somebody does upset us, we don't have to rise to it and get offended and start kicking and screaming and fight and battle back. We have to have a love grace one unto the other and we have to make effort and it does take effort. When you're hurt by what somebody said or done, it takes effort to show grace and to maintain peace. But that is what the Lord asks of us. And our heart attitude will cause us to rise up and get the victory and the reconciliation when we do it God's way. Or we will fight in the flesh and the division between us gets wider. And we provoke the situation 
and we promote disharmony and we create brokenness. So the love grace that we are called into out of Paul's encouragement, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And particularly in church relationships, because, you know, the world out there would look at church and say, I can't go to church because I don't fit in. I'm such a messed up person with all this sin in my life. There's no way if I went through the church door, would they receive me? They think everybody in the church is perfect, that we've cracked it. And you know as well as I do, we are far from perfect. We're on the learning curve of God, still being taught, trained and equipped, rebuked and disciplined and loved graciously into position for him. We're a work in progress, yes? So the people outside in the world look at the church and think, oh, they think they're perfect. I will never fit in. And sadly, there's many in the church that think that we are perfect. And therefore, we cannot associate with the people outside. And it's all wrong. Because we're no different to them, except we've found Jesus and we're learning a different way to live through the word of God, through his love and grace and encouragement one to the other. We're on a journey. And we're finding a different way to be. And the enemy has been defeated because every time we learn a way in Christ and we're obedient to the will of God, we overcome and we get freedom. The people outside don't know that because they haven't said yes to following Jesus. They don't understand the love grace and the truth of the cross. And that having said yes to following Jesus, he is our helper through the Holy Spirit to help us to change and be transformed and live in peace and unity one unto the other. And the people in the church who are so full of pride to think they've cracked it and they are perfect because they sit in a pew Sunday morning, have got it all wrong, and they will have a shot one day when they come face to face with the Lord and being judged for everything that they did or didn't say or they did do or they didn't do. Because they were so full of pride and self-righteousness that they believe they cracked it, they stop listening to what the word says to be on that constant transformation change journey in Christ to become who Christ created us to be. So it's so messed up and mixed up when the eye of the flesh gets in the way and pride leads. But the word says we have to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. What can I do to help and love and encourage somebody else? who may be doing wrong, but how do I have relationship with them to encourage them to consider a different way that they can make different choices and have a far better life as they live in obedience before God? How do I love somebody when they're hurting me? But that's what God calls us to do. The world says somebody hurts you, separate, get away from them and get on with your own way. Jesus says, reach out in love and grace and cover the other person in love and grace. What's going on? How do we help them? How do we love them? And we can only do that with the leading of the Spirit. In our surrender before God, that we show grace one unto the other before him. In verse 4, it says, there is one body, and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. So by faith in Jesus, we all have hope in Jesus that our lives become a far better way of life before him. There's only one body. There's the body of Christ that we all fellowship together. But there are many different characters in that body that we love and show grace. And we are learning together how to overcome and build God-given relationships together. And it's all led by the one spirit the one Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit doesn't say something different to Rachel than what he says to me. It doesn't say something different to Lee than what he's guiding me in. The truth of the word is the truth, and it's the truth for us all. And we're all on the journey of learning that truth as the Holy Spirit leads us. But there is one truth. God is God, and he's a yes. His yes is yes, his no is no. He's black and white. There is a right way, there is a wrong way. Therefore, the Holy Spirit won't lead me into one choice and lead somebody else in the body of Christ in a contradictory way to how the Spirit was leading. We're all being led the same way. But how are we listening? How are we responding? How are we being obedient? And we all learn different things in different stages of our journey of life. So there is one body, one body of people. One Holy Spirit leading us all and speaking the same truth to us, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Our, every single one of us has hope 
because of who Jesus is to us. There is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is only one Jesus. There's only one Trinity, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is only one way of faith, as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there is only one baptism in the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. There is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. As we say, Yes, to following Jesus, we get brought back into relationship with God the Father. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil is torn in two, that we have direct access through Jesus to relationship with God the Father, who is the Father of all. He is over us all. He is through us all, and he is in us all. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, God is with us. He is in us and he works through our lives for his purposes to be fulfilled. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions amongst you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. So the appeal is there to everybody in the body of Christ, that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is in Jesus that we are making our new considerations and our new choices. But we are encouraged that all of us come into agreement with each other in what we are saying. If we have a different opinion with somebody else in the church, there is a mediator that we need to turn to, the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. If we're contradictory to each other, there has to be a right and there has to be a wrong. And we need to find the truth. And if we have, have erred and we are wrong in our thinking and our ways, we have to humble ourselves before a holy God to the right teaching and correction that is brought, that we realize we are out of balance with the way of God and we take ownership of the wrong choice and repent. And in repentance, we are forgiven. And then for in that repentance, two hearts, two voices that differed when God reveals the truth when we face that truth and take responsibility for our wrong thinking, our wrong words, our wrong actions, we can be reconciled again in truth through the power of the Holy Spirit through repentance. And it could be there is a half truth in both of us. But as we seek God's truth, we both find the truth and we both have to repent for the error of our way. But we're working in a surrender before God to allow God to lead us that the Holy Spirit can teach us a different way. And we come into understanding of his will. And that takes humility and love and grace rather than the pride that says you're wrong and I'm right and I'm not going to change my mind. How many of us are so determined in pride that we can never be wrong? But God says... In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, all of you agree with one another in what you say. In other words, find that common ground of truth in Christ, that there be no divisions among you. If we're out of balance with somebody, don't enjoy the battle. Consider what part do I play in this that we can find peace? How do I love that person when they're erring? In, in error am i in in error lord show me your will show me your way and when we're examining our hearts before the lord if he doesn't bring conviction to us and what we're thinking and actioning lines up in the truth of the word we have nothing to be con concerned about because god is our our judge and if we're at peace in him then okay but then we have to love the other person to help them understand this is what the truth of the word is. This is how God is leading. This is what I believe God is saying. And we love the other person until they reach a point of the surrender of themselves to that truth. And that's their journey. We can't make their choices for them. But we have to love them patiently. So come into agreement with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but the, that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. 
In other words, come into alignment and the leading of the Holy Spirit in truth that we are counterbalanced together, believing the same. And it takes a lot of love and grace to journey that out when we live in a fallen world that tells us we can think what we think, we can do what we want to do, we can have what we want, where we want, why we want, how we want, whenever we want, and we don't have to consider other people. We don't have to prefer each other. And the world definitely doesn't want to consider the truths before God. But the Holy Spirit is our conscience through the power of the cross, through the truth of the word, our guidebook for life. And 2 Corinthians chapter 13, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. So it applies to us all, male and female, brothers and sisters. We should be rejoicing and celebrating in Jesus that there is a truth that he wants to call us into alignment with. He is on our side. Strive for full restoration. In other words, in conscience before God, do everything we can on our side to promote restoration and reconciliation in a broken relationship. Encourage one another. It's not about putting each other down to destroy each other. There should be love and encouragement. Be of one mind, live in peace. You know, when there is broken relationship, God can only reconcile that relationship where there are two willing hearts believing for that reconciliation and desiring for it to happen. To take ownership of the Choices they're, they're making to be open to Holy Spirit correction and teaching that if they are in error, they will repent and apologize. God can only reconcile where there are two willing hearts to want his truth and his reconciliation and being willing to take ownership of the choices we are making. But when we are working towards wanting that full restoration, when we're willing to encourage each other, when we're willing to find the one mind of truth in Christ, when we're willing to live in peace, the God of love and peace will be with us. He will show us the way. We can't do it without him. We need the Holy Spirit leading. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23 says, Be made new in the attitude of your mind. Our conscience before God has got to be so refined that the only thing that matters is what God says. Be made new in the attitude of your minds. All the time in the flesh that we're thinking, we cannot possibly be wrong. Our pride will rule and reign, and we will block out any new understanding that God wants to deliver to us. And in John 13, verse 35, it says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. In other words, what are we demonstrating to the world? If we're living in the ways of the world and behaving like the world behaves, there is no separation, there is no difference. But when we're in Christ and we have a conscience in him and we learn how to live out what we're speaking through the word this morning, then there is a demonstration that there is a different way to be. And when people see reconciliation of relationship happen in our own lives because we do it in a Bible-based way, then the world will look and see that we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is something different in our heart, in our attitude, and our ability to love and to show grace and take ownership of the choices that we're making, that we learn to promote peace. So by living in a biblical way to maintain relationship, love, grace, and honor one unto the other, Everyone will know that we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ as we demonstrate that love one for the other. The world is too quick to abandon and walk off in the opposite direction. We are told to stay in place and to be loved and encouraged by God to be able to do so. And Philippians chapter 2, 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 says, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. It is a joy to the Lord when we do come into a like heart and an understanding before him. That when we all have his heart and his understanding, we become like-minded in the truth of the word. That we walk in that same love that Jesus demonstrated to us, that we show it one and to the other. That we are in one leading of the Holy Spirit and one in mind, in other words, one in our understanding, one and to the other. And verse 3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves. When people are hurting and they can cause offence, it's not about us. We cannot have a selfish ambition to want to see the other person brought down and destroyed. We have to be able to take responsibility for our choices and everything in us should be loving the other person to see them encouraged and raised up, that they overcome the error of their way and they are raised back up into the fullness of all they're called to be in the body of Christ. But it says, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. This is back to the preferring I talked about earlier. How do we prefer each other? How do we put each other first? That it's all about how do I love, show grace and help this person, Lord, rather than living in constant offence. In the final verse, Romans chapter 14, verse 19. Let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Romans 14, verse 19. Let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. We are called to make every effort. God is speaking to us this morning. We are the ones hearing this message. And whoever else, else listens to the recording later, if we haven't had it brought to our attention to be able to consider it and consider a better way of living, then we are without teaching. But once we have heard it, it's a word to each and every one of us. And how will we choose to respond to it? What is God speaking into our lives right now? What is God wanting in the body of Christ at this moment in time? How is he humbling each one of us to realize we need each other? That every single one of you brings something very special and precious into my life. And I pray I bring something to yours. But the complement of who we are as the body of Christ is that we actually need each other. And the enemy will work like crazy to separate, kill and destroy relationships and take us out of place. And in doing so, we live in offence, separated. We have to take ownership of our choices and consider what are you saying here, Lord? And how do I overcome the situation I'm in by being led by your love and grace that I choose to make the effort to work towards peace, that there is mutual support, encouragement. We edify each other. We see each other raised up and we are promoting that spirit of true unity and peace. And it is all about loveness. Actually, there is one more scripture I would actually like like to bring Colossians chapter 3 Colossians chapter 3 from verse 13 and verse it's verse 13 and 14 and verse 13 says bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone forgive as the Lord forgave you there are moments whether it's intentional or unintentional, there are moments where we may offend each other, we may hurt each other. It's going to happen purely out of the humanity of who we are. We could get out of bed the wrong side and have a bad day and we take it out on others. 
but it's what we choose to do with it between ourselves, bearing with each other, forgive one another. Forgiveness is the greatest love grace of the cross. As we come in true repentance before a holy God, he chooses to forgive us and he chooses to remember no more. And he asked the same of us that we learn how to forgive each other, that whenever we're grieved by each other, we don't hold on to the offence. We choose to forgive each other quickly and easily so that offence cannot burn between us. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That is the command. Forgive each other as he forgives us. If we will not forgive each other, God cannot forgive us. And I don't want to live separated by God because I have got that un unforgiving spirit that holds me in pride and bitterness and resentment against anybody else. If I hold that this way in a parallel of relationship, this way between us, I separate myself away from God. We cannot afford not to forgive. We've got to forgive to be able to live in all the fullness of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And verse 14, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Over everything that we've been taught, it is love that covers all. God's love cover us. God's love covers us in such an incredible grace, but he asks that we show that love grace one unto the other. So put on love, which binds all the virtues of the Lord Jesus Christ together. It brings them together, and there is perfect unity that we can live in before him. We can only do this with the leading of the Holy Spirit, with a conscience in the cross. But as God is leading our lives, and we recognize in humility that we're not perfect and we cannot do it on our own, we need him. We learn how to live a different way, that our response to all people and all circumstance isn't in the attitude of the world that causes separation, division, breakdown, destruction. It's in a holy, God-led way that we can take ownership of the choices we're making and we can love graciously one unto the other, allowing each one of us to take our unique individual journey of learning and we encourage each other through it. So when the aggravation comes, we have a choice what we're going to do with it. But it's very clear what the word says. Bear with each other, forgive one another. If you have a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgives you. And in that, we put on love. That the love that God has for each one of us is released into the atmosphere in love and grace over everybody around us. That is the truth and the power of the cross. That is the unity of the body of Christ that we are being called into. How will, will we love each other despite all things. Be encouraged. We do this in the leading of the Spirit, but God is speaking, and we all have to take ownership of the relationships we have one unto the other on how we nav navigate it in all purity and truth, in love, grace, and freedom through the power of the cross. In the name of Jesus, amen.